Our guest today is a man of many talents. He's an actor known for his roles in hit TV shows, and his voice has brought countless characters to life in animation. He's a seeker of truths and enigmatic corners of the world. You've seen him in many, many movies and TV series, but beyond the glow of the screen, he's taken his passion for the unexplained and plunged into the dense forest of the remote wilderness. He has become a part of a team, an expedition team, and a TV series called Expedition Bigfoot. His drive to explore the unknown has not only captivated audiences, but has also sparked conversations about the mysteries that may wander through the hidden valleys and untamed forests of our world. Welcome, Mr. Bryce Johnson, to our show. Oh, thank you so much, Billy. Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this is going to be great. I've been looking forward to talking to you. I've been following your, your account for many years. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. <laughs> hey, so vice, vice cool. versa, man. I, uh, yeah. I've been following you as well, and I always love the uh, incredible content that you're always putting out and the, and the great positive message as well. So uh, thank you. It, it resonates with me. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Can you tell... Um, you know, for my viewers who have maybe don't know who you are, a little bit about yourself, just a little backstory. Yeah, of course. So, uh, you know, I, I came out to L.A. when I was 19 to pursue uh, film and television. And, and that's what I've pretty much been doing for the last 20 years. But beyond that, you know, one of my other true passions is this passion for the strange and unknown. You know, when I was a young boy, I had this sort of strange encounter in my childhood bedroom, I saw this sort of this demon-esque creature sort of, uh, you know, uh, walk through my window. For, and I was in the middle of a sleep. It was around 3 a.m. My eyes just woke up to this, yeah. this creature peering into my soul. I couldn't go mm -hmm. back to sleep. And, uh, but anyway, that really sent me on a, on a journey to love and explore all things strange. So, you know, I, I'm sure like a lot of your listeners and probably even you yourself, I hit the library and I was looking up books about ghosts and Loch Ness Monster. And then, of course, yeah. Bigfoot, uh, which led me to doing Bobcat Goldthwait's found footage horror film, Willow Creek, in 2010. Mm -hmm. I had done another movie with Bobcat, but he called me out of the blue and he said, I'm thinking about doing a, uh, a found footage Bigfoot movie. Uh, would you be interested? And I said, you have no idea. I'm your man. And because uh, I've always had an interest, as soon as I saw that Patterson Gimlin film footage on, like, I think it was In Search Of, um, mm. that really crystallized in my mind that I was seeing something that I wasn't supposed to be seeing. My gut instincts told me that I was looking at uh, a, a, a creature that my parents told me didn't exist, you know? Mm. Uh, and, you know, after that, I, I was working on a TV show where I met my great friend, Michael McMillan, and we started a podcast called Bigfoot Collectors Club in 2017, literally, Billy, months before that 2017 New York Times article broke about glowing auras and Black Pentagon money, uh, mm -hmm. the UFO program. So it was the perfect timing. And mm -hmm. our podcast, we just talked to incredible guests like yourself and, and tell stories of high strangeness. So for the last five years, we've been collecting these stories of what I call high strangeness, which yeah. led me to a, a, this incredible opportunity uh, to head up a team of scientists and researchers to go looking for definitive proof of Bigfoot in, uh, in, in Discovery Channel's Expedition Bigfoot, where I serve as Expedition yeah. Operations and have for the last four years. Wow. Wow. Amazing. That's, man, that's magnificent. What's really interesting about this whole Bigfoot story is it just seems to go on for, you know, decade after decade after decade, no matter how far back you go. And there's even some strange accounts of similar beings in ancient Sumerian tablets and some of these ancient Ooh. tales. Yeah. You know, when you're talking about from the um, uh, from Sumeria uh, down in through uh, the some of the places in you like Bosnia, um, you start hearing these tales up in the areas of Russia near the Caucasus Mountains, you start hearing these tales as well. So I'm wondering if potentially these beings or these entities could be connected in some way to these ancient accounts. Have you heard, heard anything about these, you know, these Bigfoot tales being connected to ancient stories? Well, yeah, there's, there's some incredible research that's been done, you know, just trying to link this idea of, you know, we, we pretty much feel that giants existed uh in the past you know the skeletal remains have been discovered and and lost since then and 
and and reports are abound going back hundreds if not thousands of years and and they all sort of fall under this category of giant uh wild man of the woods this uh you know this upright walking you know half man half ape creature so yeah you know just to to touch on your point earlier yeah this is this bigfoot phenomenon as i call it and it is a phenomenon because whether the creature exists or not there's a mystery at play happening globally. People are seeing and experiencing something mm -hmm. uh, that goes beyond just misidentification of wildlife or, or simply hoax or hallucination. You know, people are having these encounters with this creature. And I've talked to a lot of these witnesses, Billy, and when I talk to them, you know, they're very hesitant to sort of tell me their story because they don't have a lot to gain. They're not getting money or fame yeah. from, and as a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. They're they're receiving a lot of ridicule at times from their peer groups and their friends and family. So it's a lot for a witness to come out and and give their a, account of seeing one of these creatures. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. whether they exist or not, there's a phenomenon happening. People are experiencing something. So I'm I'm deftly interested in what's actually taking place with this with this big hairy monster thing that's happening, right. especially here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. And, you know, it's really good that you're doing this type of research because all we can do is create a certain amount of circumstantial evidence to back up a theory or a hypothesis or accounts. And so the amount of work that you're doing, along with many others, it keeps helping us build a story behind what this phenomenon actually is. Now, when you're going out, you're trying to create this expedition team, right? And so how do you blend, you know, the mystery of something mythological like a Bigfoot, along with mm. the scientific team needed to put this all together. How do you get these scientists on board to say, you know what, let's take some technology with us and, and try to figure this out? Well, that that's exactly right. And, you know, look, we, we sort of always had the, the premise of we can explore any idea, but we have to keep one foot grounded in science. You know, mm. in order for a sort of main the mainstream public to to latch onto this Bigfoot thing and sort of take it seriously, they want to see the science behind it. And fortunately for these Bigfoot encounters, there's a plethora of evidence left behind. And like mm -hmm. you said, you know, we may not have that like, uh, you know, undisputable videographic evidence or have a Bigfoot on a lab table, but we do have footprints that speak volumes as to what these creatures are, photographic, videographic evidence. We have multiple witness encounters. We have hundreds, if not thousands of testimonies, hair samples, uh, confounding DNA results. So um, when you put all this sort of evidence together, it really creates a compelling picture that this Bigfoot thing is real. Yeah, yeah, incredible. And during the expeditions that you've been on with your team, have you ever felt like the scene you were in was like straight out of a movie, any type of weird experience or thing that you guys been able to capture or at least see? Yeah, Kentucky was a super strange place. So, you know, when you're in those uh, at the foothills of those Appalachian Mountains, uh, Appalachian Mountains, as they would call oh, yeah. them, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of high strangeness in that area. And beyond looking for this, you know, unconfirmed North American wood ape, uh, you're also, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the stranger aspects of Bigfootery is what I like to call it. So what that means to me is uh, sort of this phenomena associated with Bigfoot, like orbs of orbs of light, uh, strange uh, craft in the sky, sometimes black helicopters or, or lights seen in the sky. Um, you know, there's a lot of strange phenomena that often gets uh, dispelled in these Bigfoot accounts because... Uh, people have an idea what, of what a Bigfoot encounter should be. And anything outside of that, they really don't want to hear about it. You know, for example, the, the, the BFRO, the Bigfoot Field Research Organization, mm -hmm. you know, if, they're, if they get a report that says, oh, and then I saw a, a ball of light sort of meander through the woods, they're going to they're gonna put that report in the trash because it sort of doesn't fit inside what they think a, a Bigfoot report should be. But I like that stuff. I like yeah. the strange stuff because when you when it starts to get a little weird, then I can start to pick up clues from other cases and patterns of other phenomena. Because the more I look into this stuff, Billy, the the more I have a hard time uh, thinking that all this stuff is not somehow related under this right. umbrella of what we call the paranormal. Yeah, so true. 
I mean, there are some accounts not too even not too long ago, like where they were talking about potentially the great aliens somehow being connected potentially to these Bigfoot creatures or some advanced beings, maybe from another world or maybe beings even from this world that maybe we haven't even had some type of contact with or open communication with uh, that are somehow in communication or engaging in some way or somehow collaborating uh, or maybe watching these mm. Bigfoot creatures. Maybe like yeah. they seem to be some type of a, a seeded species and they're still being watched and monitored, kind of like how we would watch and monitor an extinct or going extinct species, you know, in the Serengeti Plains. We would tag them. We would watch them. We would take pictures and videos of them. We would hide in these actual things called hides and video mm. and monitor them. We put hidden cameras around that they couldn't detect us. Uh, I wonder if there's something similar going on with these beings. I mean, uh, you know, I'm open to anything. You know, the, there is this motif that these creatures are the guardians of the forest. And, you know, people do sort of get these ideas of conservationship uh, of the, you know, uh, of the ecological system that we're fastly, uh, you know, getting rid of. And you'll see a similar theme in UFO contactees as well. Uh, a lot of UFO contactees sort of have these visions of apocalyptic uh, futures and and saving the planet. So there are similar motifs that these that these beings do represent. Um, mm -hmm. It's such a strange phenomena. I I, I love it. And uh, yeah, you know, and 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 I was going to say, you know, there is a connection, and there are cases where these uh, large, hairy, upright walking creatures are seen in connection with a craft often a craft that's landed in a field so people have made that connection that there might be something uh with these ufos having to do with these bigfoot species here on earth yeah it'd be interesting you know the more i read into these ancient tablets and texts and cylinder scrolls papyruses and, and scriptures and everything else it almost seems to me <laughs> that even human beings are probably some type of potentially abandoned seed colony on this planet and that we ourselves are also being watched uh, and monitored, you know, just like we would, like I said before, we would do an animal in, in the wild. And so we ourselves could be a version of a Bigfoot that's being looked at and maybe even being looked upon or looked over or taken care of in some kind of way. This planet could be a giant Eden, so to speak, which, which, which would be pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. You're, you're speaking my language. I, absolutely. Yeah. Th this idea that... Uh, you know, there's so many ideas about why we're here, what we're doing here. You know, was it panspermia? Was it directed panspermia? Are we put here for a purpose? Yeah. Or, you know, I have a lot of these ideas that a lot of this phenomena could psychologically be coming from us. You know, I'm, I'm very much into the psychological aspect of this phenomenon mm. because the more I look into it, there does seem to be sort of an interplay relationship with the observer and the phenomenon. Uh, with however it represents or manifests itself. Uh, so you can never leave the psychological aspects of altered states of consciousness, the psyche, uh, out of these experiences. And, that, you know, because we need, we need to look more into that area. I always like to think there's this sort of representation that, that Bigfoot represents, which is our past, sort of this, you know, man of the forest, uh, strong and, 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 uh, you know, just living off the land in a symbiotic relationship, whereas this alien gray sort of represents man's possible future link, right? Big brains, uh, small bodies, not, not, a, not a lot of need to eat, perhaps uh, AI interface and integrated, you know, and we sit right here in the middle, in the middle of these two things, you know, yeah. so perhaps these are placed in front of us by the phenomena to keep sort of pushing us forward along our evolution so that we can one day soon leave this placenta of Earth and, and you know, become a spacefaring species, as I believe we're destined to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. You listen, man, we're on the same frequency. OK, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, we're really on the same frequency. That's the same concept and idea that I had. And even looking at it from, you know, a phenomena of maybe a multidimensional aspect, because some ancient texts like the Nag Hammadi, they talk about these multi-dimensional beings these elementals that have the capability of phase shifting between the third dimension and higher dimensions uh and so and you're saying you know consciously psych psychologically there's this phenomenon that's kind of attached to the con kind of conscious thought and observation 
that's happening. There's just link in between. Uh, and sometimes I know that phenomena seems to be more apparitious. You can't really kind of fully see it. You can almost kind of see, but you kind of can't. That might even be, and this is hypothesis, the ability for a being to to shift, to phase shift atomic structure between one dimension to another or even one parallel universe into another. Because I know that, you know, we're all living in frequencies. Every dimension Ooh. is at a specific frequency in a 90 degree angle above the next one. And if you have the right technology or the right abilities, if you can analyze and ac access the exact subatomic vibration of the third dimension here in this planet, you can walk right in. Maybe there are beings peering in and taking a look in, and maybe sometimes we see these paranormal phenomenon are just multidimensional beings halfway between our dimension and theirs or halfway between their parallel reality and ours. You know what I mean? I absolutely do. I mean, look, there's a lot of evidence to sort of suggest that that universes universes are sort of overlaying themselves and oftentimes mm -hmm. interlopers uh, can get caught on the other side. And that's why we see all these strange creatures yeah. like the Flatwoods Monster and the uh, Hopkinsville Goblin. And, the, and mm -hmm. the list goes on and on about these strange charade of characters, each one more strange and, and, and different than the other. So um, yeah, where where is all this stuff coming from? And uh, yeah, it, it it's fascinating to to look at. Um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. How do you kind of really balance like the Hollywood spotlight and all these roles and movies and so forth with the solitary rugged environment of exploring in the woods? Like how do you, how do you how do you find your balance? Well, I you know I uh, it, it's funny you know so I've been doing. Uh, Acting has been, we've been experiencing the, the writers and the SAG actor strike. So it's, there's been a little downtime, but, uh, mm. you know, it, it's funny how, you know, and I hear you talk about this stuff too. When you're, when you are focused on your passion, it will manifest itself in the strangest ways. And, and Billy, mm. if I would have told you 10 years ago that I would have been, you know, uh, heading up a team of <laughs> researchers and scientists <laughs> looking for Bigfoot and uh, doing all this this incredible stuff, I, I I would have just probably laughed it off. But but you know, the paranormal has infused my life with so much uh, mysticism and enchantment. And it just in this world that seems like it could be falling apart at any minute. The great thing about you know thinking about topics like this is it really infuses your life with this sense of wonderment and interplay mm -hmm. with a reality that's larger than what we just see with our own two eyes and here with our ears, you know, there's this magical world out there and we can interplay with it and, and, and really enchant our lives with this strange phenomena. If you, if you'll let it, you know, because, um, because I think that's the biggest mystery at our dinner plate. You know what I mean? Is like, what is, what is really going on? What, what happens after we die? Where did we come from? Where are we going? And, yeah. uh, and who, who are we, you know? Right. Right. Exactly. That's, those are really, really big questions. And, a lot of what you do in exploring this unknown really is tapping into a fractal of that bigger question, right? It's the, it's the bigger question, really. When we search for these things, these mysteries and these myths, and we try to figure out and see behind the veil, it's really a part of us trying to learn more about ourselves. Because I truly do believe that there is only one consciousness. So even if there is a Bigfoot, it's still us. And so yeah, when we're looking yeah. for it, we're looking for ourselves. You know what I mean? Oh my God. Yeah. A hundred percent. We, we, we just know so little about who we are, yeah. what we're capable of and, and perhaps, uh, the stage of metamorphosis that we're in right now, because, you know, we are metamorphosizing. Uh, we are going to be exiting this planet at some point, uh, yeah. uh, by force or by will, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are going through something. So this, this, phenomena our past our technological and, and uh ancient past and where we're going they're all tied to uh you know how we can live our lives and engage with this so that we can speed up the process maybe a little bit oh yeah definitely i do i do believe that the past is prologue and this is why i study the ancient past so studiously because i understand that until we truthfully and fully understand what happened in the past and analyze it break it down discern it and learn from it we can't claim our birthright properly in the proper time period, which is space travel, which is reclaiming our, our right 
to, you know, to be a space, a, a race that is in space and traveling through space and visiting and, and, and inhabiting other planets and so forth, because our sun has only got about 5 billion more years to somebody. The layman may think, oh, that's a long time. But that's a blink of an eye, man, <laughs> you know, in geological time scales. Uh, and there's so many, we're living in such a um, a small window of what we will call peace in this Ooh. sector of the galaxy, right? I mean, a Ooh. small window. I mean, we've only gotten to this point with 100 years ago, we were uh, horse buggy and carriage. And now we've got remote control cars on Mars. And we've got the Voyagers have already, I think, left interstellar space. They passed through the Oort cloud, or at least I think one of them has. And yeah. so we're talking about in only a hundred years, but that's even less than a blink of an eye. So we're talking about, wow, we really should be looking at ways to get off planet. We should be looking at ways to to uh, ensure the future of the human race, of our species, which is probably, in my opinion, how human beings got here in the first place. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, you, if you've ever read or, or listened to any of the Aboriginal history from Australia, it's incredible. They say that they were the first people seated on this planet by the Pleiadians. Mm. Right. And when I looked into that, I discovered that there was an ancient galactic war in that sector of the galaxy. And there were space refugees. People were fleeing exploding planets. They had something called the Brahma Honda weapon, which was blowing up planets and blowing up moons. And so Earth itself could be a result of one of these space fearing races that created a breakaway civilization here. And in some ways, we could be, like I said, you know, being watched and monitored as there's a certain higher level, not higher level because they're spiritually better, but just that they've got more knowledge spiritually and technologically than us. And they're just mm -hmm. watching us continue to grow and develop. But there's just we have to claim you're right. I think we have to claim our, our birthright, which is getting back into space and um, and moving on to other planets and moons and maybe even out of the solar system. Eventually, I think yeah. that's really where we're going. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, and to your point, there does seem to be sort of a, a lost technology uh, that we had that we don't have present today. And, mm -hmm. and while we are sort of this technologically obsessed society, which we are, we've left behind this important element, which is, I think, this lost technology that we, we're talking about, which I think is a spiritual technology in some, in some yes. way or form where you could sort of move between both the spiritual and the physical world, you know. Um, and, and until we sort of embrace what that means for us, because as a human society, we've left a lot of that behind. We, we sort of look at nature as something to overcome and oppose and to take from. We don't look at it as something that we can learn from and, 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 and that it has this consciousness of its own that we can learn right. from. Uh, you know, so until we sort of get back some of those old technological ways, uh, only then, I think, can we, can we really truly move forward because it's going to take more uh, than just uh, circuit boards and, and AI. It's going to take a spiritual uh, advancement uh, to, to really, to really uh, you know, fully travel amongst the stars, I, I think. Yeah, no, you're right. It's going to be a combination of tech and spirituality. And people have been taught that the two things are completely separate, but they actually blend perfectly together because spirituality mm -hmm. is technology. It's just a divine version of technology. And then we as a fractal or we uti utilizing our fractalized minds create what we call hardware, which is just a fractal version of the spiritual technology that's already built into our avatar bodies and into the universe as a whole. And so we just try to mimic what already exists in a format, in a rudimentary format that we can understand better. But you're right, in the future, there'll be a combination of technology be between technology and spirituality it'll be combined into one. I know in the, in the book I wrote, Compendium of the Animal Tablets, Thoth talks about utilizing spiritual aspects of, of, of conscious thought, the waves from his own mind, combined with photons and cymatic frequencies, which is sound, mm. to create and manifest solid matter. I mean, you know, so we haven't even gotten close to that yet. They just finally right. took some photons with cymatics and created a tiny molecule out of it. So now they know they can do it, but these beings, obviously, you're talking tens of thousands of years ago. They were so far more advanced than us. Uh, it's really, it's really incredible. You know, this is a, this is maybe another show that you can work on in the future. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would love that. I'm definitely interested in sort of exploring that that topic more because there does seem to be some meat on the bone there, uh, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Man, this is this is incredible. I'm just, I'm, so, I'm so pleased to be talking with somebody that's like minded that has 
some of the same ideas and concepts, you know, that, uh, you know, that I've been throwing around in my mind for decades. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of us out there that are, that are looking for answers and, and enjoy the search, you know, uh, for, for me, uh, the in finding answers has never been as fun as going on the journey of, of, of exploring the question, you know, which can lead down to different rabbit holes and different other areas of investigation. So, uh, what I love about the the paranormal world, uh, it, you know, the ancient tech and, and uh, ancient civilizations and all this stuff is that it 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 just it makes you curious. And if if, if curious curiosity is like a little fire, you know, the more the more you can put on it, and the more you can turn it into this engulfing flame, I think uh, I think the better your that your life will be enriched. You know, so stay curious yeah. about your world because. Uh, reality is not what it appears to be. I don't think anyway. I, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions I still have about the actual nature of the reality that we're living in. So, yeah, which brings you to my next question: Like, in what ways do you think the search for Bigfoot parallels the meaning in our own lives? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think I think we li are living in a time where um, we are just so flooded with uh, a to do list and. And, uh, and 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 scrolling and sort of uh, just kind of feel this feeling of running in in, in circles, you know, and, uh, and and I think this sort of search for for Bigfoot is really in a way a search to kind of go back in a way to uh, you know my my friend Bobcat Goldthwait would often say the great thing about going on a Bigfoot on is if you don't find Bigfoot you really just ended up camping, uh, which is not <laughs> a bad thing, and it's so true. It's just like hey, you know, at the end of the day. Just get out in nature, you know, take a quick little nature walk, a little hike, you know, smell a flower, look around, uh, you know, uh, and then that could lead to bigger adventures. But uh, yeah, getting outside, taking a little bit more time to enjoy yeah. life. And then, yeah. Absolutely. You know, when I first started researching uh, into these, what I would call paranormal UFOs or whatever, it was 1977. I had saw a UFO in my backyard. We're going way back now. <laughs> I yeah, was seven years wow. old. Wow. Yeah. And um, I didn't know what I saw. I, the word UFO, flying saucer, it didn't exist in my vocabulary, right? Mm. Uh, but I went to my school, Rainbow Park Elementary, and I got the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is the Google, the original Google, right? Yes, that's and right. I started looking through aerospace technology. I was looking at swept wing, delta wing, you know, lifting vehicles. I, I researched everything about the Wright brothers, ballistics, intercontinental ballistics. I mean, I went in deep. Um, and all I could find was machines that we ourselves created, but not what I saw, which looked more, not complete egg shape, but slightly uh, more oval than an egg, completely mm -hmm. silent, glowing metal, and, and, and moving at incredible speeds. And so... I remember I, I wanted to talk to a few people about it, but nobody wanted to really say anything about it. I found two friends I can talk to in the bushes, right? <laughs> Away from the other kids. Wow, and, yeah. And, you know, we were talking about, could they be from the ocean? Could they be from space? Where are these, you know, what was that? Or was it, you know, was the military? And then, but I went from hiding in the bushes to a few years later, exchanging conspiracies on VHS tapes <laughs> to exchanging cassette tapes years later, to exchanging uh, CDs, to DVDs, to web forums, to blogs, to websites, and now you're on TV, right? And I'm right, on TV. Right. So there's this progression. <laughs> how has the current, uh, how has this phenomenon been accepted more around your peers of like, you know, people who are considered to be actors and actresses and, and, uh, and so yeah. forth? How are they accepting this information? Well, I'm still that Bigfoot guy. And unfortunately, you know, Bigfoot isn't sort of seeing the same mainstream love that UFOs are experiencing right yeah. now. Uh, maybe maybe one day uh, soon Bigfoot's love will come. But until then, I, you know, I, I still get a lot of snirks and sneers. And, 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 and but, you know, even as, a, that, even as a child, that's never really bothered me. And as a matter of fact, it almost uh, sort of motivates me I, I i love it i love when when somebody comes in as a as a skeptic but but, but if they're a little bit open-minded if they leave a little bit of door a little bit of the door open i can wiggle my foot in there and i can get in there and i can make a great case for just about anything and uh yeah. and, and and you know so um i forgot what the question was but uh <laughs> but yeah uh i don't know 
No, that was that was it. That's good. That's perfect, man. That's perfect. You know, we're just, you know, it's just like this journey has happened. This 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 growth and the acceptance of alternative information and other ways of thinking is growing at an exponential rate. Is pretty much you know the point I'm trying to make. Um, even within you know minority communities like mine, where everyone was just completely locked into religion, almost on a zealot level. I'm starting to see that that slightly give way to more spiritual concepts and spiritual mm-hmm. aspects. And so it's just, there's this, this evolution that really is happening in our minds uh, and humankind uh, slowly, but it is happening. I can see this gradual process. It's like a, it's like buying, buying a, a really good, you know, stock, you know, mm-hmm. like there's something, you know, that over time it's going to go up and down, but over time, eventually it will rise gradually. And yeah. so that's what, it, you know, a blue chip is like, we, you know, this is like a blue chip stock. And over time, it's still rising and rising as it, it does have its ups and its downs, but it still seems to be rising. This type of alternative information. And I think the proof of it is that you're on mainstream TV talking about, you know, this alternative type of information to the point where you've got a whole research team out in the jungle looking for something that would be considered mythological and so forth. So. Hats off, oh, yeah. teammate, because that's really amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. And listen, those the 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 viewers and the fans who love that show, they're they're diehard and they 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 believe in this thing and they love following the adventure and and you know they're right along with us too. There's been so many moments where they spot like something in the background that we didn't even notice and they'll circle mm. it and send it to us. And wow. you know, but to to speak on your point, uh Joseph Campbell used to talk about uh, you know how how so, sometimes he felt that the major religions had had failed us in a sense that they that they that they no longer incorporated magic into into people's daily lives, you know. And I think mm-hmm. to your point, Billy, I I think people want to sort of take back a little bit of that spiritual power, and that's yeah. why you know uh you know a little some paganism and witch witchdom is on the rise again, and you know people just want to sort of experience their own spirituality for themselves. Mm-hmm. Because there is magic to be held, and and they don't want gatekeepers uh, holding back that magic. Right. So true. So true. We've had the gatekeepers for, for long enough, mm-hmm. and there's people like you know yourself and and many others that are helping to break open that door with shows like the one that you've done and and many other shows. I did notice something pretty interesting. I saw that you had a role in Oppenheimer, which I just saw that not too long oh, ago. Oh yeah. 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 Wow. Well, That's you'll, incredible. You'll- Thank you so much. You'll you'll love this too. And I and I, uh, so I played a, a U.S. Army Air Force officer of the 509th, which is mm-hmm. located uh, right there in New Mexico. And it was the 509th bomb group. They were the only atomic bomb group, so they were commissioned with handling uh, the two nuclear bombs that were built by the Manhattan Project. Now mm-hmm. later, as those bombs were dropped, and in 1947, when a supposed crash vehicle landed in uh in the new mexican desert it was the 509th bomb group uh that was tasked with picking up the pieces of that craft and sort of covering up a lot of uh of what went down there so there was a little ufo easter egg in there in the role that i was playing i tried to chase down christopher nolan and let him know that that, but he was a very busy man and i just said hey it was a pleasure thank you so much for the opportunity but uh, right. It was it was it was a it was a dream of a lifetime to be part of uh, such a uh, a film like that. I've always wanted to do a blockbuster film for a for an A list director. So uh, yeah. so that was a real dream come true. Yeah, that was it was phenomenal and amazing. And I caught on to that that whole thing because once those bombs were created and tested, that's when I believe personally. This is my hypothesis. Mm. That nuclear explosion, splitting of the atom, it sends out a specific frequency into space. Yep. And I believe that it, with the right detection uh, sensor array, which would be an advanced race of people, they're always scanning for that frequency to find out which planet of sentient beings can now split the atom. Yeah. And when that signal was received, they said, "Uh oh, let's go take a look. And that's when they came here to take a peek to see what was going on. Uh, and I believe that uh, the reason why that that uh, there was more than one crash that day, actually, there were several. But mm-hmm. the reason why they were brought down is uh, the United States were using utilizing something called scalar radar. And this mm-hmm. scalar technology is a very disruptive form of radar, which really scrambles navigation systems. 
And so some people say, well, UFOs are real and these people can travel across space and blah, 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 blah. Why would they just get here and then crash? Well, space travel is very dangerous, number one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and who has the anticipation to account for every different type of threat that exists, yet alone a scalar wave being hit, yeah. you know, your ship being hit by that, and how it would affect your ship. They may not even consider that that wave even exists. You just never know. And, though, and so I believe that's what, what uh, uh, put their ship into disarray and forced it down. Uh, but again, that's just a hypothesis, but pretty interesting stuff. And it was so cool that you got you got a chance to, to be in there. That was, that was so so great, man. Yeah, well, if your fans ever want to uh, listen on my podcast, Bigfoot Collectors Club, we did a deep dive three-part series on the history uh, mm -hmm. of Roswell. It's a fun listen. We had a whole great cast of characters, and and you'll get the the Roswell four one one. But yeah, there's there's I love that case because, uh, like you said, and, and the evidence does point to that after that splitting of the atom and and releasing those bombs, there was a UFO flap the likes of which we never saw before. Uh, UFOs exploded onto the scene uh, in yeah. the middle of the, the 40s and late 40s and 50s. And and uh, that was a big reason why. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt about it. And what's the name of your podcast again? Uh, Bigfoot Collectors Club, available okay. wherever you get your podcasts. Yep. Beautiful. We'll make sure we put that in the caption of this video. And you guys make sure you check that podcast out. So what other projects are you working on now? What do you have coming up next? Well, I've got a few pokers in the fire. Uh, nothing I can really talk about yet, but uh, believe me, I'm trying to expand in this field. I absolutely love exploring the phenomena, as I call it, and 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 getting a chance to do so is the opportunity of a lifetime. So, uh, you know, I, I want to champion people's eyewitness testimony. I want to bring mystery back into people's life and... Uh, and 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 that's what being in the bigfoot business does so uh i love exploring and and, and looking for uh and engaging with this phenomenon beautiful beautiful man well i'm looking forward to seeing a lot more of you and i'm working on a couple of new films actual edutainment films real films oh, not great, documentary great. But real films and i'd love to give you an opportunity for a casting call to potentially see if it's a role that you may want to play or be involved in when we get those great. down Great. Yeah. I think we'll be doing some stuff in the future too, Billy. No doubt about yeah. it. No doubt. That'd be, that would be amazing. If there's any last word you would like to say to the listeners, what would you tell them? I uh, I would just say thanks for uh, <laughs> entertaining a lot of my uh, half thought up ideas. I appreciate it. I know it takes a lot of leeway uh, sometimes looking into this stuff, but believe you me, there is a phenomenon at play on this planet. And when you engage in that mystery and when you let a little bit of mystery into your life, uh it just makes it all the more fuller because uh something's going on out there and i for one want to know what it is all right beautiful all right how can they find you on social media and everywhere else yeah absolutely i'm a, i'm all on those socials i'm on instagram at mr bryce johnson and on twitter at bryce o johnson and you can stream all four seasons of expedition bigfoot right now on discovery plus and max Bryce Johnson, hey man, it's a pleasure talking to you finally. I'm glad we got a chance to catch up. Oh, the pleasure was all mine, Billy. Uh, thank you so much, and let's do it again soon. Absolutely. Thank you, man. All right. Talk to you later.